everybody, this is Off Lease with Eric Prince. I'm Mark Serrano. The Hooties are wreaking havoc across the region, almost like a Hollywood script. So, they're getting more successful in their terror, Eric. We've got, uh, in particular, uh, February 18th, the Rubimar cargo ship was sunk after a missile strike. And far more importantly, everyone aboard was evacuated. Far more importantly, the True Confidence, uh, which is a you know, shipping uh, uh, vessel, had the first fatalities by the Houthis. It was uh, one Vietnamese and, and two, two Filipino. Filipinos. Yep. These are deckhands, right? These yeah. are hardworking these are, guys. These are the, the most blue collar of workers just getting crushed. They're not getting paid much. It's a rough, rugged life, and I, I feel terrible for that. But the, the, the Houthis have drawn blood yeah. now. Right, yeah. so they're they're amping it up, they're creating terror within the region, they are you know blocking the straits up into the Red Sea, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. So let's first talk about these two vessels and what you know about how they were taken out. Well, the the, the bad thing is there's supposed to be this task force, Operation Prosperity Garden Guardian of U.S. and other Allied ships that are supposed to be protecting these vessels now. These two guys that just got hit were one of the, some of the very, very, very few vessels, I guess, brave enough or dumb enough to still try to trade through those waters, and they got smacked. They didn't meet any of the criteria that the Houthis were selecting to be, you know, attacked. They were not Israeli-owned. They were not Western-owned. Heck, the, the, the Ruby Mar was carrying fertilizer, and the other guys that got hit were carrying steel and trucks. So if there's such a thing as being a shipping vessel safe to go through the Red Sea, these ships qualified but no more. Yes, correct. And, and so it's just it, between the Iranian targeting ship, the Seviz, that's still cruising around those waters, and some basically some homemade targeting radars that the Houthis turn on, find a target, uh, and take a shot, they're, um, they're still shooting at whatever's left. And, and once in a while, they do launch a lot of uh, missiles at these warships out there. The point that I think just two weeks ago, one of the one of the Houthi missiles got within a mile of a U.S. Navy destroyer, and the, I was it was it was closer than missile range. They had to shoot it down with the uh, the automated cannon called the Seawis, the close in close close in weapon system. So to, this operation, so this operation to bring security back to the Red Sea is an abject failure. Apparently not correct, right? Because because the, the the volume of shipping has gone down by over 95 percent, and after these two. Uh, Hits, I don't think anybody's going to sail through there. So that's a dramatic... I mean, there, there are guys with the Houthis getting medals today because they drew blood. They took out, you know, two, uh, two major vessels. And it was the, the uh, Indian Navy showed up to evacuate the other 20 yep. uh, aboard um, the True Confidence, where there, there were, you know, three perished. Uh, and many injuries. Sadly, they had true confidence in the U.S. military's ability to protect them, and they were left wanting. All right, so let's go to this slide, Eric. Uh, you know, this is sort of a chart showing us the strikes that have taken place at the hands of the Houthis, correct? Throughout yeah, this, they're, they're basically the behaving like long-range pirates now, because you know, the Somali pirates they would go out in a boat, maybe they'd go a few hundred miles offshore and try to grab a vessel. Right. Now, with the homemade radars or the Iranian intelligence vessel that's still cruising around those waters, which for some reason hasn't sunk. So Iran is just responsible for intel. And it's, it's obviously valuable intel. They're doing They're their job. They're finding and fixing, and the Houthis are finishing. Okay, so now where are the missile strikes coming from? Where are they, where are they sourced from? Um, well, supposedly, the, the friendlies in the red area is supposed to control that entire coastline. Apparently not, right? Because the Houthis can still move through there with a truck, with a, with a truck-mounted missile and, um, or a drone. The green region is all controlled by the Houthis. Uh, their main port is Hodeida. And uh, it is most important for the, uh, the guys in red to take Hodeida and to just put pressure on the Houthis uh, to choke them off economically uh, and defeat them militarily uh, for this to work. But this is, I mean, th that's a dramatic image right there. All these are successful strikes from the Houthis, which are, are just, you know, desert rats. I mean, are, are these just the terrorists who live out in the desert and... And they're getting the financing from Iran. They got the technical support, the weapons, and the training from Iran. Literally embedded IRGC officers. 
and they're, uh, they've now effectively choked off one of the world's busiest shipping ways. The Bab al Mandab is only 17 miles wide at its narrowest point, but they're taking shots, as you can see, well up and down the straits, and even out in the, uh, in the Gulf of Aden. So, so again, loitering munitions, they have, there have been some that have been hit even, even you know, five, uh, even a thousand miles offshore targeting uh, vessels. So but this is, an, this is an impressive level of sophistication. I mean, uh, this one story references an array of sophisticated weapons being used by the Houthis, including ballistic missiles and kamikaze drones. I mean, right. it's, explain it's that for it's us. It's important to note that all the same weapons that have been smacking all these ships here are also present in Venezuela because right. the Iranians have actually put a factory there. They are do, doing production, providing the Venezuelan um, socialist regime the same ability to choke off the Panama Canal that these guys have to choke off the Babel Mandela. So let's make no doubt about this, that, that that's Iran's riches thanks to Joe Biden. I mean, yes. there's no other way to explain that. He lifted Three, the sanctions. They made a the ton sanctions. of money on oil sales. $3 billion a month is what they make in oil sales. $3 billion a month. Yes. And they literally have a factory in Venezuela. Cranking out the same stuff that's taking shots here. Look, it doesn't take that many IRGC officers in country to do that properly. You can send 10, you can send 20. You have two competent people to, uh, to program the, the fire control system to get a, uh, a, a launch. Because a lot of those are lock on after launch. So it'll fly to the area and with, a, with some kind of data link, they can, uh, they can guide the weapon to the ship that they want to hit. Okay, so they go, they go to the area, they know their ship's there and, and they're picking their target once they're airborne. That's especially the case with like the Shahed 136 drone because it's kind of slow and it flies out there and it's looking, they can communicate with it and hit it. This only gets solved when someone goes and puts a boot on the neck of the Houthis and makes them stop. Okay. Because the U.S. Navy cruising these waters clearly is not getting it done. They're shooting $2 million missiles to knock down cheap drones or cheap, much cheaper missiles that the Houthis keep firing at them. Again, we have a Marine Corps to go over the, to go over the beach um, from, you know, to project power onto land. I know the U.S. is not going to send forces there. They don't need to. There are private solutions available to fix this, but the Biden administration is way too stubborn, uh, and they reject history because, again, the last time there was a problem in Yemen that needed fixing, it was done by David Sterling, the founder of the SAS and a private military company, which, uh, which worked. So and those the boots that you're talking about should be paid contractors, regardless of the few. origins. It's a few. Because there are actually Yemeni forces that want to fight and finish the Houthis and prevent them. Because look, the sanctions and all the nonsense and the violence that's affecting all of Yemen comes from the Houthis. And the rest of the Yemenis are pissed about it. So there are enabling forces, just like you had in the first six months in Afghanistan after 9-11, when you had a couple of hundred SOF supporting the Northern Alliance and they smashed the Taliban. A similar experience could be done here with a few hundred advisors with a little bit of air power and a little bit of drone support to smash the Houthis. And the those same advisors way. would be contractors in, in principle. Absolutely. Right? To, in, to uh, train. In, in fact, they would be in contractors. In fact, to train <laughs> and equip the Yemenis. Yeah, train, equip, and enable, and really to operate some of the sophisticated systems. A couple of aircraft, um, some drones, and, and people basically to, to perform a, a JTAC, an ability to control the air, whatever's delivering weapons, to deliver it effectively on the ground. You could roll the Houthis up. Okay, so, uh, you know, this has failed. Now blood is drawn. Next slide. Yeah, and you can see the massive economic impact, right? So this is now affecting Egypt. 40% um, of their GDP depends on that traffic. Five up to six million tons, million metric tons per day. And then now after those two hits on those ships, it's going to go to zero. That's 40, represents 40% 40 of Egypt's economy. And the only reason Egypt's economy hasn't really collapsed is the UAE bought a big chunk of land in the western desert of Egypt near the Libyan border to basically build a new city, harbor, state, um, uh, a new resort area, trade hub, etc. They injected $35 billion into the Egyptian economy. That's the only thing that's saving Egypt, Egypt from collapse. And this is now. recent. This is just done. This is just in the last few weeks. Because, again, 40% of their economy is going to zero because the Suez traffic is going to zero because of a totally failed maritime deterrence and a, and, and a lack of solutions to deal with the Houthis. This is, that's a dramatic image right there. 
That, so there are, there's uh, 23,000 ships a year pass through the Bab El Mandab yep. Strait, saying that correctly, um, connecting the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden to the Suez Canal, accounting for around 12% of global trade. Uh, the cost of insuring a seven-day voyage <laughs> through the Red Sea has risen by hundreds of thousands of dollars since November, probably more by now. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the rates are now going to be reflected in the Ruby Mar cargo ship uh, sinking and the true confidence. Uh, so the costs are going up and up and up. It takes an additional 10 days. It adds on 10 days to go around the Cape of Good Hope. And that's added another half a million barrels a day to uh, global oil consumption just by having to power those ships that much farther. So even the Greens should Wait be pissed about this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're the climate change people. Exactly. Demanding to have an answer, a solution to that. Where do we go? What, what, what do you think this administration is going to do next? Now, obviously, they say, well, we'll have a response to the sinking of, uh, of, the, of the ship with the three deaths. We'll have a response to that. Well, their, their responses have been largely useless so far because they telegraphed their, their very expensive missile strikes. Um, the fact that um, you know they, they telegraph it gives the the Houthis or the Iranian militias when they were claiming they were gonna they're gonna smash them. Because remember, we had three Americans killed in Jordan by an Iranian proxy weapon launched from inside of Iraq. The U.S. is supposed to respond. They do some very half measures, not not right away, and not killing all the leadership or the or the manpower. In addition to 165 strikes on U.S. positions? 165, that, yes, Same exactly. time period, right? Yep. And so now we've got... And very lucky we haven't had more deaths. So this, this, shut this, it all down. this image here is from an actual um, uh, large missile, a um, effectively a cruise missile that slammed in the side, hit the engine room, and killed uh, three of the crew. Again, that, crew, that ship was carrying uh, buses, you can see on the deck, and, uh, and steel below decks. Pretty, pretty basic cargo. This is incredible. It's, this whole dynamic is dramatic. It's depressing because I don't really see where this goes next. The enemy gets a vote. The enemy has gotten a lot more sophisticated. Um, the last time something like this was happening was in the 1980s, and I think it was a uh, gothic serpent or so when President Reagan basically destroyed the entire Iranian Navy in a day because they were mining the Persian Gulf then. They were shooting at tankers just like this. And the U.S. Navy got off leash for a couple days, right. and they smashed the Iranian Navy, and they delivered consequences. That needs to happen here. The Iranian vessel that's providing all this targeting information needs to needs to go away. So we know what the uh, what the Prince Plan would be: contractors in in uh, Yemen training contractors, and so forth. Contractors, SF advisors, ground branch people, but repeat what was done well by the CIA after 9-11 in northern Afghanistan, which smashed the Taliban in a matter of weeks. Okay, so we know that that's the logical, sensible, common sense approach. What options will this administration <laughs> look at with the sinking of the... Uh, uh, the Ruby Mar. And the true confidence. Yeah. Look, I think this is the uh, emblematic of the Biden foreign policy right there. It has failed. They don't know what to do. They, they, I'm, in, in the, and I'm sure... I have no doubt that Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken and the senior officers are really frustrated because the Pentagon will give them nothing but horrifically large, expensive, cumbersome options, right? Because the Army will say, well, we're going to go in there with 10,000 men. And the Marine Corps will say, I'm going to take the 1st Marine Division. Instead of saying, ah, 50 to 100 advisors enabling locals with a little bit of air power, a little bit of sophistication, and we pressure the, pressurize the Houthis. That's the nuanced approach. That's what exactly what the CIA should be doing with its proper authorities. 10% of things can be handled by diplomats and embassies. Maybe the other 10% in statecraft can be handled by the Pentagon, but there, the Pentagon is supposed to be big and mean and, and like a big, um, a big scary attack dog that you never have to let go, hopefully. The middle is the intelligence world. This should absolutely be a Title 50 solution to pressurize the Houthis and to make them uh, respect some international So here's our exit on this segment, and that is the perfect emblematic image of Biden foreign policy. And the next target, sadly, the next ship could be a U.S. Navy or other allied vessel that gets hit. Because if they launch three, four, or five weapons at the same vessel, 
they highly increase their odds of one of those getting through. So they're clearly escalating. They're being more successful. Oh, yeah. Uh, it they, want like, to, they want to hit a U.S. Navy warship. And that sounds like, tragically, that's what it may take for us to deliver the proper response. Am, am I wrong? Again, I don't know that the U.S. military is capable of delivering a proper response because they would be so calculating and so lawyering every strike and, and preventing effective violence of action. The first rule of special operations, speed, surprise, violence of action. Speed, surprise, violence of action. Yeah, and that sounds very harsh, but that's what it requires. This is not get solved by diplomats pleading. These are people, the Houthis, when they make a strike, they say, death to America, death to Israel, victory of Islam, right? They, so we, we, might not be the, we might not think we're the Houthis' enemy, but they definitely think that, that we are the I'll tell you what's harsh. You know what's harsh? There's two Filipinos and one Vietnamese who knows exactly what's really harsh. Yeah, and, and, and look, a, a U.S. Navy warship, the USS Cole, was blown up in Yemen by terrorists in a suicide mm -hmm. boat. Mm -hmm. Now the terrorists have uh, weapons that can deliver a payload out to 1,000 kilometers. In the midst of all of this, the defense secretary appears before Congress to basically apologize, his hat in hand, his tail between his legs, because he mishandled his own health crisis and, and notifying the White House and so forth. It's, so this is the guy who's in charge uh, of our military. Yes. And he, he looks like a buffoon before Congress, rightly so. It's, it, it, we, um, elections have consequences. What, you know, we have nine months until this election. That's a long time for a lot of ships to sink. Mark, what I've said before is I feel like early in the Biden administration, I said, we're gonna have a Jimmy Carter II part, part time. We have hostages now. We have ships being sunk. We have friendly allies getting rolled over or under great threat. Uh, and it's going to be a wild and woolly summer, so it buckle just, up. It blows my mind that it's difficult to even articulate what the U.S. may be considering as a response because you know that they're feckless and they probably don't even, they, they can't agree between state and defense. That's really, it's, it's a disaster. Again, I can't even imagine what those principles meetings are, right? Where they, when they have the, the leaders of these things and they all come up with, there's no innovation, there's no audacity, and there's no one willing to make a decision to say, Follow me, let's go solve this thing. There's no damn moral outrage either. And we've got Joe Biden whistling past the graveyard. Afraid so. Incredible. This has been another amazing rundown of what's taking place in the Red Sea at the hands of the Houthis who have now drawn blood. Only here on Off Leash with Eric Prince, I'm Mark Serrano. Thanks for joining.